as they come down, will you pray with me? God of the miraculous, both big and small, help us as we take this journey through the Gospel of John that we see the power that Jesus had then and the power that Jesus wishes to display now. God, grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive all that you would have for us during this season of Lent, this season of discovery. We claim the most amazing miracle of all, that you love us, all of us, with a death-defying, grace-exuding, never-ending love. So may our faith, like the disciples and the servants in our focus scripture for today, may it blossom. We ask this in the name of the grave robber himself, Jesus, the miracle-working Christ. Amen and amen. There are 34 distinct miracles that are recorded throughout the four Gospels, while countless others we imagine went unrecorded. But John's Gospel uniquely spotlights seven miracles, four of which are unique to the Gospel that bears John's name. These seven signs, if you will, reveal a new dimension of God's power and of God's personality. They unveil the seven miraculous uh, dimensions of Jesus' power, and each one, as we go along week by week, gets more and more amazing. Like the sun rising in the east, each of these miracles reveals yet another ray of God's glory until Lazarus steps out of the shadow of his tomb four days after his funeral and into the light of the grave robber. Throughout the book, Mark Batterson speaks about these miracles, and he says that the book isn't about miracles, it's about the one who came and can perform them. He encourages us that we not seek miracles, but that we follow Jesus. And if we follow Jesus long enough and far enough, that we will be part of a miracle or two ourselves. You desire a miracle, don't you? You might need a miracle, huh? I know there's some people in here that do. Some of them desperately need a miracle, a cure for cancer, perhaps. An understanding to a really difficult relationship. We all have a need, but you know what the amazing things about miracles is? In order to have one, there has to be a problem or some kind of issue or circumstance that necessitates one, right? I don't know about you, but I spend my time trying to avoid those things, right? And I work real hard to do that. But yet, life happens, right? And so you find yourself like Mary did, and Jesus, and all those who had gathered at this wedding feast in Cana. Weddings were a big deal back then. Well, actually, they're a big deal to most of us now, right? Well, some of us, anyway. Some of us. It's a big deal. And, and so they're there at this wedding, and we don't know why, but whether they didn't order enough or people drank too much of it, but they ran out of wine. And this <laughs> seems like a big deal to Joel, but it just doesn't seem like, you know, <laughs> if it's out, it's time to go, right? I mean, <clears throat> and it doesn't seem like a big deal, but in the first century, it would have been, it would have been a huge deal of shame for those people, for the, for, the, for the families of those who were getting married. It would have been a big deal. And, and Mary understands that this is a big deal, right? And so what does Mary do? She goes to Jesus, right? And what does she say to Jesus? She says, Jesus. She says they have no wine. She didn't say fix it. She said they have no wine. She stated the problem, did she? She just said, look, look, Jesus, they're out. It's, uh, it's empty. I'm all gone. Right? They have no more wine. Now, some might think, okay, that's my ex. It's time to go, right? Party's over, okay, right? Mary simply stated the problem. And so I believe that's what this scripture lesson, the first thing it teaches us, is that when we find ourselves in the middle of a situation, right? That we bring it to Jesus, right? When you have a problem, Mary taught us that you bring it to Jesus. That's it. 
You bring it to Jesus, right? And the amazing thing about this, and Batterson even talks about this in his book, and Max Lucado talks about it in another book that he wrote. And, he's, and they both say that what Mary did and what she didn't do are both amazing. One is just as amazing as the other. Mary goes and states the problem to Jesus. What she didn't do was tell him how to do it. Right. <laughs> Ain't that cool, huh? <laughs> You ever had a problem and then you go to Jesus and tell him how he ought to solve it for you? Pick me, pick me, pick me. More times than not, right? Right? Mary just tells him there's a problem. And then Jesus gets into this temper tantrum kind of thing with her because, you know, he says, woman. I don't know about you, but I would not call my mother woman, okay? <laughs> But he says, woman, he does not even address her to acknowledge the relationship that they have. He simply says, woman, basically, it's not my time. What does this have to do with either of us? It's not our problem. It's not my party. It's not my problem, right? And what does Mary do? She, she didn't say a word, right? She... She, she just turned around. What did she do? She turned around and said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. <laughs> she didn't wait for nothing. He had, she let him have his little spat, right? That's a mama. Right, that's a mama, right? Let him do his little thing, and then she said, do whatever he tells you. Right? Which is the second most amazing thing. We have to trust Jesus to be the catalyst for the transformation. And here's the cool thing, is that... Mary didn't tell Jesus what to do because she trusted Jesus to handle it, that Jesus would be the catalyst for the transformation. She, Max Lucado says that she could, have, she could have said, now Jesus, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go down to the corner to that vineyard down there and I want you to press some grapes and I want you to you know, quickly do that and make it into wine real fast and ferment them and all that. You know, that takes years, doesn't it? But do all that and then bring it back to the... the right? she, didn't, she didn't tell him how to do it, right? She didn't tell the servants how to do it. All she told them was, just go do whatever he tells you to do, right? She didn't try to blame the party, you know, which we can often do. Is, you know, what kind of people is this that they're going to run out of some wine at the party? I mean, right? She's not going to just complain about the family that didn't kind of do their thing, right? She didn't even complain to Jesus. She didn't even, she didn't even guilt Jesus by saying, you know, what kind, of, what kind of Savior are you going to be if you can't even help these folks with some wine, right? Right? Have you ever thought, Jesus, what kind of God are you if you let me go through? If you can't say amen, say ouch. Been there, right? What kind of God would let the, the party run out of wine, right? She didn't blame herself. She didn't play victim. Like, Lord, if I'd have just played, if I'd have just brought my stash from home, if I, it would. How many times do you insert yourself into somebody else's problem and, and make it about you? Lord Jesus, right? But Mary says to the to the servants, "Just do what He tells you to do." She doesn't have to articulate the solution. Because she doesn't know the solution, but she knows the one who does know, right? And so she trusts it to him, and then she, she tells the servants, you can trust him, just do whatever he tells you to do. And so it says, John tells us next that Jesus noticed the six stone water jars that were over there that were used for water, for the Jewish purification rites, and everybody would have these. Everybody would have these stone water jars. And Jesus notices these water jars, and, and he says, and they hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. And he said, fill up the jars to these servants. Fill up the jars. And so they go and do what Jesus tells you to do, right? Go and fill up the jars, fill them up with water. And then when they did that, he said, now take some out and take it to the head waiter, right? And what happens when they do what Jesus said, and then they take, take it to the waiter. The waiter says, my goodness. Normally, normally people 
serve the good wine first and then bring out the inferior wine when nobody cares anymore, right? <laughs> when you don't even know where you are, especially what you're drinking. It don't even matter at that, I guess. I'm not, I'm not one of those, but I, I trust you that that's true. Right? It is. It is, okay. But. <laughs> we have an expert witness in the room and it's going to work, okay? He tastes it and it becomes wine. Now, who in the room knew that they put water in that pot? Just those two servants, right? That's it. Jesus didn't have to go up and announce, I've done it, I've saved the day, I've made this, I've tra-, right? And look at me, look at me. It doesn't say exactly, but I'm guessing there was two of them. And two people in the room knew that what was in that thing was, what went in there was water. But what came out of there was wine. Jesus did that. Jesus is the catalyst for every transformation. Batterson gives a little example in his book. He, he talks about how the Lego people, that some of the Lego executives had gone and they had this, this meeting with some of the entrepreneurs and some of the folks that were interested in their business and, and they met and he handed each, the speaker handed each of the people just six little Legos, right? And he said, you know, just put them together however. And then he asked the question, you know, how many combinations do you think you could make out of these six little Legos, right? And people guess in the hundreds or whatever. And do you realize that out of six Legos, there are 915,130,765 options for six Legos? Right? What does that tell you? If God can do, make n- not, not over 900 million options out of six Legos, what can God do with my problem? Right? Right? How might God be wanting to transform us? we got to bring the problem to Jesus and trust Jesus to be the catalyst for that transformation. And then lastly, Batterson says in his book, the most amazing thing. He says, the coolest thing about this whole water to wine story is that it begins the, the seven signs that John speaks about Jesus. But it, it makes us remember the end of the book of John where Jesus at this table with all of his friends gathered round took an ordinary cup of wine or grape juice. I imagine it was some good old grape juice. And do you realize that when he blessed it and thanked God for it, he said, this is my life force which is poured out for you. And it reminds us of the blood that Jesus would shed for us, right? And so this simple cup of wine becomes an endless, bottomless pit of grace. So every time we drink of this, it's not just a cup of wine, it's a bottomless pit of grace for everybody a bottomless pit. When we went to New York City this past year, one of the things that we did, we were great tourists, and one of the things that we did was I wanted to go to the 9-11 memorial, and you know crybaby me, I cried the moment I stepped up, walking toward it, I just started crying. And it was the most amazing thing Thing. And we went on this tour, and, and we, they talked about the firefighters, and they talked about all this, but then we went to that pool, and they made where those buildings stood. They made of it this pool, and this is a picture I took with my iPhone, just standing there, and around that, around the, the square where that building once stood, 
or is this wall with everybody's name that was sacrificed in that building. And it lights up at night. It was just beautiful. But over that wall, there's this pool. And out of that, around that wall, there are individual streams of water that come up. And there are individual streams that number the people that were lost. And, and the, uh, the architect said that, that they wanted to remember and they wanted to see that there are individual streams of water to represent those people and to represent the tears that flow. And those tears come out of that, that fountain and they go down and then there's this hole in the middle of that larger square and you just can't see the bottom of it. And they said they wanted to remember that there will never be an end to the sorrow that these folks feel over those that were lost. You can't see the end of it. And I believe that's what Jesus was reminding us in this first miracle. What He would do at the very last. That all those water jars that He filled up with water would become wine to remind us there's an endless, bottomless pit of grace ready for us. There's more than enough where Jesus is involved. And saints, it is my desire and it is my prayer for Joy Metropolitan Community Church that we bring our problems and our burdens to Jesus that we remember that He is the catalyst for every transformation and that we can be transformed. Not just some wine. We can be transformed. You know, you might have a burden in your life. You might have a problem. You might be going through some stuff. And most people may not even know what all you're going through. Where you've been. What you've done. What brought you to this place. But saints, Jesus is the answer. We just have to bring it to Him. Bring your burden. Bring your problem. And trust Jesus not only can, but Jesus will transform things. And I want Jesus to start with me. Transform me, God. Jesus is more, more than enough. Right before the service, I had this was my two o'clock in the morning thing. Saw the burden and the problem. Bring it to Jesus. The ushers have some papers in the back, and Miss D has some. And they have that on there. Burden, transformation, Jesus, bring it. Pass them out. Let somebody have them. Let each person have one. And as we sing this next song, I invite you, if you have a burden or if you have a problem, or if you need something in your life, no matter how big or how small, bring it to Jesus. This is simply a piece of paper, but you know what's written on there. You know what needs to be there, right? And I invite you, forget anybody else is in the room but you and Jesus. And I want you to take it. I need that big basket, and I'm going to mess up offering, but I promise to give it back. When you're ready, I want you to walk down this aisle, and I want you to drop it in this basket. Saints, we leave our burden here. And guess what? Don't pick it back up after you leave it in there. It's going to go away. 
When that offering goes back there, it's going to go back there with it and you can't take it with you. Leave it here with Jesus today, right? So that we might be transformed, so that we might trust in a God who loved us enough to help us at a wedding party to change something we needed. May God continue to change us one step at a time. And may we trust that God will do everything God says. I invite you now, as you come, as we sing, bring your burden, bring your trouble, bring it to Jesus. Amen.